we more or less continue on the message of last Sunday and the Sunday before when we talked about self-control, self-sacrifice and <coughs> uh, now I want to see at how we follow Christ uh, in two things uh, in his death and in his resurrection and um, for this I want to read from Colossians chapter 2 verse 20 through 23 and it's a very specific um, angle actually that uh, Paul uses here in the letter to the Colossians to address these issues and we will, we will recognize them wherefore if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances touch not taste not handle not which are all to perish with the uh, using after the commandments and doctrines of man which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh okay he says a whole lot of things and uh, at first glance it's a bit difficult but uh, we'll see um, that uh, it all makes perfect sense um, so he speaks first of all there in uh, beginning of verse 20 wherefore if you be dead with Christ so that is actually what we should be as followers of Christ we should be dead with Christ that is the first thing um, that we look at <clears throat> so what is the effect of being dead with Christ um, well, he, he continues right away, he says, dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, or the elements of the world. Uh, the, world the word is uh, stichion, which is uh, the basic um, principles, the basic the foundation, eh? or the fundaments, basic principles. It can have a second meaning, uh, being cosmic spirits, which... You could also explain in this context somehow, but um, I think it's not what he means in first instance. The cosmic spirits would be all spirits other than the Holy Spirit, so all the evil spirits. We are of course dead to them, uh, but um, that's not what Paul um, alludes to. From the context of the preceding verses, we can understand that he is um, mainly speaking uh, about religious ordinances. And for example, in verses 16 and 17, he says, uh, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he's pointing to, to uh, um, of course, the Judaic religious ordinances, uh, to eat only kosher food, and to observe all the, the holy days, the Sabbaths, uh, the new moon. We know these things uh, have directly to do with the uh, Judaic uh, holidays. So he, he says, um, you are actually dead to these rudiments of the world, these, these religious ordinances. In verse 18 and 19, he says then, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, um, intruding into those things which ha he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increase it with the increase of God. So there in verse 18 he refers to, to these um, religious elements that come from paganism, from the heathens. So you have obviously there both Christians that come out of uh, Judaism and you have Christians that come out of paganism and both bring their their ordinances as religious doctrines. Um, and that's what he is, uh, that's the context in which he is speaking. So uh, he doesn't only speak about being dead to the things of the world but uh, also being dead to the religions of the world. 
And that is, uh, of course, uh, certainly nowadays it's a very dangerous subject because we have to be politically correct and we have to also be religiously correct. And um, as we see all these things happening with interfaith and coexist and uh, tolerance and all these things, um, you are almost uh, not allowed to say anything wrong about anything religious. But uh, if we look at scripture, we see um, that... Um, First of all, Jesus himself is very much against uh, all these religious ordinances if this is the motivation of men. And we see it in the many discussions he has with the Pharisees and the scribes. And, and secondly, Paul is also addressing this um, in different occasions, uh, in, in all of his letters, I would say. So here we, he talks about this, these rudiments, the elements of the world is the basic principles of the religions of the world. And so what, is, what does he say then about the religions of the world? Because the verses 21 um, um, through 23, it's actually short in, in a number of letters, but or words, but uh, there's a lot of uh, things said. First of all, he says it is conformed to men of the world. In other words, it suits those living in the world. The religions are conformed to the world, which means they are not um, after God's ordinances. They, Jesus calls us out of the world to be transformed and not to be conformed to the world. So, of course, we are living in the world, but we are not of this world, uh, John 17. But... Um, but certainly as a religion should be a vehicle to, um, to worship God, to honor God, we see actually often the opposite. It is, it is um, suiting men, allowing men of the world that live in the world to have some form of godliness or spirituality, if you will. And... Um, this is, this is uh, really against God's will. Um, James uh, puts it very strong in, in chapter 4, verse 4. Because although this, this is religion, it is still worldly in every sense. Because it's, it's based on worldly things. Um, there are, of course, many examples. But if you only look at, at um, many of the religious feasts... Uh, take Easter as opposed to Passover. Uh, Easter is based on Ishtar and is based on pagan holidays. The date is also set on a, a pagan holiday and not on the original day uh, as it is observed in, in uh, uh, Judaism still. Or take Christmas, uh, which is again uh, the winter solstice. It's a pagan uh, feast. It's not based on the actual date that uh, Jesus was born. So religion has conformed to the world with these things. And these are just uh, two examples. There are many, many more, of course. So in James 4, verse 4, it's written, You adulterous and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So whether it be religion or not, it is still friendship with the world, and thus enmity of God, or the enemy of God. And he call, calls it adultery, which is a very heavy word, but it's, it's indeed the same word, or the same analogy that uh, is used throughout the Old Testament when we see all the time the, the Israelites uh, deviating from, from God. Uh, God uses the same, um, the same uh, metaphor of uh, adultery or, or even fornication or these things. Conforming to the world, that's when one characteristic of this type of, um, of, of this religion. And this is of all times, but of course it has increased over the ages uh, as religion became more organized, more institutionalized, more powerful, 
um, we see more and more of these things and um, today of course uh, we see all kind of worldly things uh, creeping into the religions that we could never have imagined even uh, some years ago um, but we know also where it's going and I, I will come back to that in a minute so secondly he says it are uh, religions of ordinances the mere fact that there are all these ordinances is is, um, is, is, is one is a bad characteristic actually eh? it's do this do that or as it's written here touch not taste not handle not so these are all ordinances that are being created on top of God's law God has already given us what to do and what not to do but now the so-called wise men have to create their own rules these are works and regulations that can be kept and done by the natural man that is the whole point if spirituality is lacking it has to be solved in a natural way God is supernatural God's spirit is supernatural it enables us to do things that go against our fleshly nature um, but if this spirit is lacking it has to be filled in with other things and these are uh, in many cases these these religious ordinances um, you committed a sin well uh, say a certain prayer uh, early in the morning uh, nine days in a row and, and you're okay this kind of ordinances there are so many of them and um, the natural man can easily do them and uh, make himself believe that this is uh, this is okay but of course this is not in scripture at all and, and um, again, in the context where Paul is uh, speaking about, he refers to this keeping of the feasts, of the Sabbaths, of the new moon. Um, and many were doing these exact things exactly according to the law or according to whatever they believe. Uh, and, and thought because of that, they were okay with God. And uh, scripture is very clear that we can never um, be saved through these things. Um, famous verse of course Ephesians 2 verse 9 which says not of works lest any man should boast uh, the whole context there that we are saved through grace uh, or by grace through, through faith so, but not by works and in Romans 10 verse 3 it says for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God so by not uh, accepting and acknowledging God's righteousness they create their own righteousness that's what happening through all these ordinances they create their own righteousness and um, this means they have not submitted to God or to the righteousness of God so religion often creates these ordinances to fill in this this lack of spirituality uh, and of uh, acknowledging the righteousness of God. Um, thirdly, um, he says there also in verse 22, Colossians uh, 2, that um, they they are all to perish with the using so all these things all these ordinances and works they they will perish they are not investment in eternity in the heavenly things they are all worldly uh, in essence and this means that they will all perish meaning also that those that keep them and that build their faith on these things they will also perish along with these things they cannot bring salvation as we just saw in Ephesians 2 verse 9 it's, it's not by works that one can be saved so it does not bring salvation and uh, this word to perish is very um, strong and very tragic um, it is so often when you are uh, in, a, in a company of people of non-believers and uh, sometimes you realize that actually most of them um, 
will perish because they, they just uh, do not accept God uh, and, and they, they just don't want to be saved. And uh, obviously that's not what God wants. Um, if we see two, Second Peter 3 verse 9, we read a lot this verse, <laughs> because it has everything to do with the end time prophecy and about the time we live in. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But he is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing that anyone should perish. Every single soul he brings in this world is meant to live in eternity in the glory of God and, and not to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And that's, that's the, the, the other side of the scale. So he does not want anyone to perish, the other side of the scale, but, it says, but that all should come to repentance. Because if you come to repentance, then you won't perish. It's either or. Um, this is uh, again uh, reflected in Romans 2, verse 4. Because these are the things that are unperishable. That is what God offers. It's almost the same. Eh? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So just as in Second um, Peter it speaks about his long suffering. And it is with one purpose, this goodness of God, to lead one to repentance. And, and that is unperishable. Man doesn't realize how good God is. Uh, especially, yeah, especially if you talk with, with non-believers, uh, they will say, yes, but look what's happening in the world. How can this God allow all this? And they don't see that God is actually waiting for them and for everyone else to come to repentance. Um, and that is exactly that is the cause of all this uh, misery that people do not see his goodness um, in Psalm 31 verse 19 it speaks about this goodness of God mm. oh how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of man And that is, uh, this is a psalm of David, where he, he once again sees how great God is. It is often, e easily we forget, you know, when certainly when things go, go well, or when we are too um, occupied with, um, with our, our problems or worries or whatever, um, then we forget how great God is. And for this purpose, of course, he gave his son, John 3, verse 16, of course, for... God so much loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? So that no one has to perish. But everyone should have everlasting life. So, um, so the, the religious ordinances, they are all perishable things. And those that hold on to those things, perish with them. That's extremely tragic because, because they are actually um, willing or open to, to some sort of, of religion, to some sort of godliness or spirituality, but they find it in the wrong things. Then, uh, fourthly, the religions of the world are after the commandments, it says there also in verse 22, after the commandments and doctrines of man. Which means that they are not based on the commandments and doctrines of God. You do different things. It's of course in line with what we said before. It's friendship with the world. It's conforming to the world. It is all these perishable things of the world. So they are after the commandments and doctrines of men. And there you see also how important it is that each and every individual believer tests all these things and not just follows a church or a church leader blindly because this church or church leader might um, bring doctrines that are 
after man or after himself and not after scripture so um, you see also the importance of, of all the templates all the examples all the metaphors that God has given in his word as we also study them uh, th throughout the Old Testament in the feasts in the, uh, the tabernacle the temple the, uh, the work uh, and the clothing of the priests um, all these things he gives us templates on how to do things and so we can s easily uh, or easily if, if we have take some effort to study these things we can see whether something is according to the ordinances of God or not and um, we I mentioned this example also uh, last week or the week before I don't remember but uh, if you see how the priesthood the, the earthly priesthood has ended the 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 garment of the high priest is rent, the veil is rent, then you can simply see to all these religions that still hold up to all these priests with their garments and all these things and even have uh, literally a veil behind the altar that is still closed for the, 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 the visitors of the church or the congregation, you see that something's wrong. It, there is some... Uh, connection with scripture but at some point it doesn't match anymore and so these these are just all kinds of examples that people can uh, recognize no one can actually say uh, I didn't know because we all have this responsibility to um, to study the word ourselves and to test and it says in, in many places examine yourself and, and test uh, whether these things are true God's word never contradicts itself. So we, we see the importance of uh, understanding and studying these things. At the same time, of course, we need also spiritual discernment to understand them correctly. Because uh, if we go again with our own wisdom, then um, there are always many ways to explain things and many interpretations you can follow. Um, so that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 9 and 10. Um, we need God's Spirit to, to understand the depths of God's Word. And also in Proverbs 3 it is, I think, to not lean on your own understanding. Although even, even if, if one would honestly do that with his own understanding, but, but uh, sincerely study Scripture with his own understanding, he would still, still find the truth. The spiritual discernment will come afterwards, but uh, there are many examples of people who have, from an um, atheistic perspective, studied the word to prove uh, that it's wrong, and they found the truth. So even if you would do it sincerely, you will still find the truth. But of course, as believers, we have this advantage of spiritual discernment that God gives us, and uh, in that way, he can reveal much more to us. So then... Um, Fifthly, he says um, in verse 23, these things shoe, uh, have indeed a shoe of wisdom. So they seem wise. They seem wise. And indeed, to, to men of the world, these things, these religious ordinances and all these things, they seem wise. They sound very appealing. They sound very sensible. Um, so they seem wise if you hear uh, religious leaders speak about world peace and about taking care of the environment and uh, tolerance towards each other. All these things sound very good, very positive and all this, of course. Um, and in, in itself they are not, not wrong, but they are all based on the wisdom of men and on, on, um, on the world. Um, <coughs> And the word of God is very clear in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19. This wisdom of man is, um, is crushed, I would say. It says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So this wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. And this quote there where he says, for it is written, it's from Job 5, verse 13 through 15. 
And of course, it is the enemy who uses these religions to make people believe that they are righteous believers, that they are okay. And, um, and so it has to be convincing. So there is all this wisdom and all this, um, this, this forms of spirituality that, um, that seem very, very godly. Then, uh, lastly, in this list, um, also in verse 23, he says there is um, um, worship, uh, will of wor worship and humility um, and neglecting the body. So there is uh, this, this humility and self-sacrifice and neglecting the body, but it is false humility. Why? Uh, he gives it right away there. He says... Uh, it is satisfying the flesh. So the motivation to do these things is not to honor God or to obey God. It is actually pride. And it's satisfying the flesh. To, um, to have a religious ordinance to wake up uh, uh, nine days in a row at five o'clock in the morning and go on your knees and say a certain prayer in order to get rid of a sin or to be forgiven, a certain sin forgiven. These are religious ordinances. They, they, um, they are not in obedience to God. It is satisfying the flesh. And um, sometimes these things are even harmful, of course, to the body. Some religions, they go very far in uh, inflicting uh, pain or suffering upon oneself. And this is not honoring the body as the temple of the spirit. God does not want us to do these things. Um, in some cases, yes, we can fast, for example, but if to fast is not to hunger yourself uh, almost to death and, and uh, in, in a very unhealthy way. That is not what God wants for, from us. And in many religions, by the way, there is fasting. Uh, thinking specifically of, of Far Eastern religions, where they do a lot of fasting, uh, combined with meditation, which is all focused on the flesh. It has nothing to do with any god. Uh, if you see, for example, in Buddhism, they don't even have a god, because Buddha is, is a man. Uh, it's all focused on, on self and on the, the divinity in oneself. So it's, um, it seems very spiritual and very high, but it's, it's actually vain and uh, indeed perishable. It's only focused on, on self. And, and their, their greatest examples are those that fasted so long until they literally died in their position of meditation and uh, they, they were mummified like that. There are several of these examples. Uh, this, this is only the self and it's absolutely not what God wants. So this kind of, of, um, of worship and humility and self-sacrifice, it seems in the eyes of men, Men of the world, it seems very, very lofty, but actually um, it is all satisfying the flesh and nothing else. It's pride. And all these things, they um, show not to be dead with Christ, but actually to be very worldly, very fleshly. They're all focused on, on the world, on the men of the world, ordinances of the world wisdom of the world um, and that is these are characteristics of many religions and there is of course a purpose why this is all of this is happening why the enemy has um, so much influence in religions because we know that um, in these last seven years the Antichrist or the beast, as Revelation calls him, will uh, uh, proclaim himself to be God and to be worshipped, force man to be worshipped as a God and, and man will. And of course, uh, this is not something that we read in Revelation. It's in the Old Testament already. Uh, uh, o far has thou fallen, speaking about Lucifer and that he wants to exalt himself above the throne of God. So we know that is his desire and his plan from the beginning. 
and and he uses religions uh, to get to that point to bring man to that point and so I've uh, had this one article that came out this week or actually September 13 in breaking Israel news because we have in um, Jerusalem this uh, Mecca desert uh, happening uh, event uh, that is going on which gets very little uh, media attention uh, which is um, art and music but it's also every day there are uh, services uh, ecumenical you could say it's between Islam um, Christians and uh, Jews so they pray together and they worship together uh, these are the three, um, as they say, three Abrahamic um, religions. But uh, what, uh, what caught my attention was this article in Breaking Israel News that uh, at the same time uh, in, in Jerusalem as well, there is another event going on. And um, it says, I want to read from this, it says uh, over 20 religious leaders from East Asia arrived in Israel Monday for a four-day summit in Jerusalem. Participants came from countries such as China, South Korea, India, Japan, representing spiritual traditions of Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Jainism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, I never heard of it before. <laughs> Throughout the upcoming week, they will come face to face with Arab and Israel religious leaders of Ju Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So this really combines uh, the whole package, I would say. And um, uh, I go on here, quote, it is time to expand the Israel-Asia dialogue from only diplomatic and economic spheres to religion, spirituality, and faith. Summit coordinator Shimona Halperin told Zapit Press Service. This is a first meeting in history between the religious leaders of Judaism and those of the Eastern faiths. First in history. The summit was a joint project between Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ameri American Jewish Committee and World Council of Religious Leaders. Notable guests include the President of the Buddhist Association of China, Xuang Cheng, Swami Avdeshyanand Giri, spiritual leader of millions of Indian Hindus, and Baba Yain, Secretary General of the World Council of Religious Leaders. And President Reuven Rivlin greeted the summit participants. Uh, he said, quote, Welcome to Jerusalem, the holy city of the religions of the sons of Abraham, Riv Rivlin told the guests. Your arrival is a very special event for many years. The interaction between our religions hardly even existed. This is no longer the situation as your visit today shows, Rivlin said. Swang Cheng and Swami Giri also addressed the summit saying religious leaders should take a leading role towards solving worldwide social and environmental challenges. I'm very happy to be here, said the Swami. We have uh, a saying in our uh, colloquial tongue, when you have dialogues, then the wisdom dawns and knowledge comes. Dialogue imparts clarity. So here you have exactly what we just read. This is this wisdom of the world, this religious wisdom, uh, if you will, that is its foolishness in the eyes of God. Um, Xuang Cheng expressed his hope to make lasting friendships among religious leaders in Israel. Only if we make true friends, we can really set the goal of mutual respect and understanding. The Chinese religions are working very hard to call out other religions to help in the construction of a peaceful world, he said. According to Halperin, during the four days of the summit, the religious leaders will meet rabbis from all Jewish streams, as well as with Muslim, Druze and Christian leaders. The group will tour holy sites and discuss uh, current events including global warming, the environment, status of religion in contemporary society, the role of religion in peacemaking and more. Our spiritual worlds have, uh, are very close to each other in that they are not missionary religions which makes them very open and tolerant. Rabbi Daniel Sperber, a professor of Talmud 
at, uh, at uh, Bar uh, Ilan University, an Orthodox rabbi. I feel a unity and camaraderie between our peoples, more so than with the Western world and Christianity. Mm -hmm. This is a rabbi speaking. So uh, I will leave the link to this article. Um, but you see exactly uh, where it's all going to. It's all becoming one soup, uh, unity. Um, and I use uh, things like global warming and, uh, and peace, of course, to, um, to motivate this and to get more uh, support from the general public. But uh, it, it's coming together at a very fast uh, pace. And um, so that is what Paul means if he says, if, you're, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, you have to be dead to those things if you follow Christ. You cannot be um, part of this worldliness, although it's called religion and although they speak about, about Abraham and about uh, God and all this, uh, no, it has nothing to do with it. Um, now there is a second thing. It's not only to be dead with Christ, it's also to be risen with Christ. Uh, because otherwise there would not be a perspective. Um, being risen with um, Christ gives us a new life. Being dead means the old life has died, it's gone. But being risen means there is new life. And he actually continues in the next chapter, uh, Colossians 3, in the first two verses, speaking about this, because this is now the logical um, following. Yeah, so in, in we read in verse 20 of chapter 2, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, and then what we all read, and now in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So now we get the new perspective. We are no longer known after the flesh. All these things we mentioned before, they have to do with the flesh. Even this, this so-called self-sacrifice that we see in so many religions, they are only serving the flesh and the pride of the heart. But now he says, um, focus on the things of, from above. And um, Jesus made that very clear himself, that we should no longer cling to the things of the flesh. Uh, in John uh, 20, it is um, after he has risen from, from death, so the, the context is also uh, important. He has now died and he is risen. So he is our example. We follow him in this same death and resurrection. So he is now risen and um, Mary uh, comes to the grave and she finds the grave empty. She thinks that the gardener is there, but then it uh, appears to be Jesus. And... Um, in uh, John 20, verse 17, well, let's start in verse 16. Jesus says unto her, Mary, and she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God in your God. So Mary wants to touch him and, and, and Jesus says touch me not or in other translations he says don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended. So this sounds very contradictory. Uh, he is there uh, uh, right in front of her and she wants to touch him and he said don't touch me because I have not yet ascended. Now uh, naturally you would say yeah but once he is ascended, she cannot touch him anymore. But that is exactly the point. He is no longer known in the flesh. He is now known above, heavenly, divine, as God. Um, and that is how we should know him, not as man, but as God, 
is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the Son of God. So that means resurrection. He is now dead to the world. He is dead to the flesh. But he is alive in the things from above. So that is the example that we should follow. We should not cling to the flesh. We should not want to to have this desire to touch the, f the worldly things, we should be focused on that which is from above. So it's a very, very stark contrast with all the other things we spoke about, all these religious ordinances, all these things that, are, that we can see and touch and do, um, and all this wisdom of the world. This is exactly op the opposite. It rejects all these things and it says no. Focus on that which is from above and no longer the elements of the world. And there, in those things, there we find rest. And I just had to think of this, how we are often so tired with all the things we have to deal with uh, in our daily life um, that seem to, to produce nothing, and, uh, or sometimes even the opposite of what we want. And um, that is the consequence of this, this sinful world. It is actually making us, us tired. And uh, I had to think of, uh, of Genesis, um, Genesis 3, where um, Adam and Eve have, have sinned, have uh, disobeyed God. And what is the consequence? What does God say to, to Adam um, in Genesis 3, verse 17? And to Adam he said, um, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, of, uh, yeah, of thy life. And in verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. So he has now to, to toil the earth, he has to work, and, and with sweat he has to, um, to get the fruit of the earth. And um, of course, this is literal, but it's also a metaphor that it, it's the consequence of this sin is is, is this toil, this this working to um, to get through life. And so, sin brings this this toil, this slavement. That is what sin brings, and that is what we see in the world around us. People are 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 enslaved. And, and they have to really toil the earth to, uh, in order to survive. There is no rest. There is restlessness, actually. Yes. And with Jesus, it's the exact opposite. In uh, Matthew 11, verse uh, 28, he, he himself says this, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. So he gives rest. And it's actually interesting, uh, this verse I have to think of now, we sang this uh, song, What a Friend I Have in Jesus, uses this ex same uh, phrase actually in there. But that is what Jesus offers. That is what belongs to the things from above. They can give rest. Um, rest that the world can never give and the wisdom of the world and all this. It's only restlessness and enslavement and toil, but Jesus says, give me your burden and I will carry it for you. So rest is one of the things that we find in the things from above. Another thing that he gives is power. Because we are often confronted with things that uh, go, that are over our heads, so to speak, we think this is impossible, I can never cope with this, or um, I can never do this. But then he also provides the means to do it, he gives strength to do it. Um, and uh, this is very well reflected in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 31, the last verse there. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
and they shall walk and not faint. Yeah, so that is, he gives power, he gives strength. When we need it, he will, he will give us this, this energy we need or this strength we need to get through the whatever situation it is. Um, there is a condition, he says, but they that wait upon the Lord. We have to wait for, the, he will give it, but at the, at the right moment. We see many examples, of course, throughout the, uh, uh, the well, all of Scripture, but the Old Testament in particular. Um, it is not like in, in Samson's case that we always have this strength as some superpower that we can just utilize whenever we want it. No, it is from God. He gives it when, we, when he thinks we need it, when it's, it's according to his plan. Samson only discovered it at the very end of his life when he had lost his power. Uh, God gave it to him one more time to fulfill his plan. And of course it was a, a tragic end, but it shows that God gives what we need. He provides at the moment of his timing, in his time, uh, which is usually in our, um, uh, in our um, perspective it's always very late. Because he is, he is precise. Uh, Moses and the Israelites also experienced this uh, when they were confronted with the Red Sea and the Egyptians uh, on their back. It was an impossible situation. But God, first of all, stopped the Egyptians with this pillar of fire and secondly opened the sea so they could proceed. This is beyond, um, beyond uh, well, it's supernatural, I could say. That's what it is. It, we cannot imagine the things that God can do when we need them, but He will do it. Um, so He gives rest, but He also gives strength or power. And thirdly, He gives joy. Uh, many unbelievers think that uh, a life with Christ is boring and is uh, very dull, but it's actually very joyful. Of course, we know, not always, but um, there is joy. In Psalm 16, among many other verses, but there, in verse 11, it speaks about this joy. And it links it right away to Jesus. Often we, it is said that Jesus is not in the Old Testament, well, we know better, he's everywhere. Also here in this psalm, <clears throat> which is like a prayer, it starts, Preserve me, O God, for in thee I do I put my trust. And then in the last verse it says, Thou wilt shew me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And who sits at the right hand of God is Jesus. So he gives joy, pleasures forevermore. That is what we can keep in front of us. So these are three um, components or characteristics of the things from above. They give rest, power or strength and joy. And these things, as opposed to the, the religious ordinances, these things are unperishable. This rest and this strength and this joy, it's unperishable. It's everlasting. As the psalm here literally says, forevermore. And um, that is why we should focus on these things and build our treasure there, not in the earthly things that are perishable. So that is the new perspective that we have when we are risen with Christ. We have this perspective of unperishable things, the rest, the strength, the joy that he gives. And resurrection means coming out of death, means new life. So the new perspective goes hand in hand with a new life. And that is uh, what Paul then um, says in verse 3 and 4 of Colossians 3. So he is... It's very logical the way he goes through things. Eh? So after the being dead with Christ and after 
being risen with Christ, he now speaks about the new life. And he says, therefore, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So, very strange, maybe, verse 3, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. So, he says, that the same, in the same sense, you are dead, and you live. Why? Yes, we, we know now we are dead to the ordinances of the, or, or the elements of the world, but we are risen in Christ, so we also live. Uh, but this life is hidden, he says, it's hidden with Christ. This perspective that we have on the things of, from above, these imperishable things, they are unseen, they are also not understood by the world. So in that sense we are hidden, our life is hidden to the, to the world. Um, I had to think of the tabernacle again. This life, um, this, this priesthood, it happens inside the tabernacle. That's where we serve God. That's where the menorah, the table of shewbread, the altar of incense, uh, all these elements of the Christian life, they are there inside, away from the eye of, of the world. They cannot see it. They cannot... Um, understand even these things so they're hidden our life is hidden with Christ the the world can see us of course and they can see also the effects of um, of our life and of to who we belong but they cannot really grasp it and that is what our our life should reflect that should be our testimony that they have this they see there is something but they cannot grasp it. And that should um, uh, awaken their curiosity and their desire to, to want to know. Um, and a sincere uh, heart will, will ask. So that's a testimony. But uh, we are hidden. The source of all of this, it's hidden. So we spoke... Uh, recently about these priestly garments and uh, one of the, th the very important things on the, the garment of the high priest was this, this, um, this hem, uh, the, the lower part where these pomegranates and bells are, which is later um, um, reflected in the clothing of, of all the children of Israel as we read, where they wear these tassels at the end of their, uh, their garments. These, these, um, these wires with the knots and why is that well it's so that it's for themselves so that they are continuously reminded of god's law but it's also for others to see who they are and to who they belong so um, in the new testament it is we have we have spiritual testicles so it's our behavior it's our life that, that reflects who we are to who we belong and it's the spirit inside us that reminds us, that convicts us. So that's the spiritual tassel, if you will. Uh, and that is what, um, what, what can be seen by the world. It should be seen by the world, actually. But the source of it, it's hidden. It's only revealed once one accepts and surrenders to Christ. So uh, the verse seems strange at first glance, but it makes very much sense. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And in verse 4 then he says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. What does it mean? Now this life is hidden. Now the source of our faith is hidden. But when he appears, we will appear with him in glory we will be fully not we the source of our faith will be fully manifested so that's again something beautiful to think of and to look forward to i saw the perfect parallel to this in uh, romans uh, chapter 8 which is um, it speaks exactly about this manifestation that will that uh, actually creation is waiting for this and um, there Paul follows the same pattern 
being dead in Christ, being risen with Christ, having the new perspective, having the hidden life, and then the, the appearance, the manifestation. It's the exact same, uh, what is it, five steps. In Romans 8, verse 10, he writes, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. So here you see, dead in Christ. And then he continues, But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Here we see being risen with Christ. And then a bit further down, verse 15, he says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again, of to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So this is the new perspective that we have. No longer the spirit of bondage, of slavery, but it's now the spirit of adoption. And we can call upon God as our Father. That's a new perspective. And then in verse 18, he writes, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So yes, there are sufferings of this present time, but, but um, this uh, life that we have is hidden. It's still hidden. But it shall be revealed in us. <coughs> And in verse 19 then it speaks about for the earnest expectation of the creature or other translations say of creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So here we have this as he writes in Colossians or to the Colossians uh, to appear with him in glory. All of creation is actually waiting for this moment because all of creation suffers. And of course, then you have to think of uh, Hosea uh, chapter 4, verse 3, that speaks that even the fowls of the air and the, the beasts of the earth and the fish in the sea, they, they die because of, of man, of sin of man. All of creation suffers and is waiting for this manifestation of the sons of God. If he appears, we appear in glory with him. Until that moment, our life in Christ is hidden. But in this hidden life, He gives us strength, He gives us rest, and um, He gives us uh, the power that we need and this hope. That's the perspective that we have. And as, as um, Creation is waiting for this manifestation. We also already experience uh, the joy that He gives. We experience His glory many times and His goodness. So that is uh, part of our Christian life. As we spoke earlier or recently about submitting, about um, self-control, self-sacrifice, we see here being dead with Christ, being risen with Christ. Amen.